All right. So looking at chapter one of uh, the sports performance training textbook, uh, this is going to be essentials of integrated training. Um, so our objectives today are to be able to define what I mean when I say integrated training uh, and what the principles of integrated training are, uh, the components, scientific rationale, and evidence for integrated training. So we'll talk about like why, uh, you know, sort of what integrated training is, um, how it is supposed to be much more effective, uh, and, you know, the evidence that kind of supports that. So uh, integrated training, you know, you'll hear this term all the time. What it means uh, is, you know, it is a comprehensive approach that attempts to improve all of the components necessary for an athlete in order to be able to perform at their highest level while also preventing injury. So basically we're talking about integrated training. <laughs> we're, we're talking about good training. <laughs> That's what I think is so funny about this definition, right? Like obviously like it is, it's it's, it's, it's the type of training that's, you know, going to be most effective at making an athlete better at what they do while also preventing injury, right? So that translates to, you know, a good training program, <laughs> right? Um, so here, here's the thing though, like, obviously, like there's, there's sort of a difference um, between this style of training someone and, and sort of just like taking someone through a training session. You guys might remember I said it's not illegal in the state of California um, to train clients without a personal training certification. Like you are absolutely welcome to go out there and start training someone even if you are not certified. Um, but um, you know, you have to make sure that it is, you have an, an integrated uh, approach to it. If you want to do a good job, you're not going to learn how to do that without like certification, right? That, that certification is sort of what um, proves to the world that you know how to create a program that we can see here is comprehensive, meaning that like it's going to cover all aspects of what makes um, you know, a good athlete, you know, integrated training. When we say it's comprehensive, I mean that you are working on their flexibility, you're working on their balance, their reactivity, uh, you're working on their, you know, strength in all areas, not just focusing on like, you know, vanity muscles, which is sort of what we see in a lot of sort of traditional training programs is it's like, you know, like if I just Google, you know, workout, workout program, it's probably not gonna be bad, you know, I mean, it's not necessarily gonna, you know, hurt anybody. Um, but here we go, right? We can see here's a three day a week program. Um, well, that's certainly very simple. That That's just kind of laying out the days here. Um, yeah, here we go, right? Here's, you know, it's like do this warm up. You do a little like, you know, kneeling hip flexor stretch, some glute bridges, uh, world's greatest stretch. And then you do like a deadlift, chin up, squat, bench press. Uh, pair that up with a little bit of accessory work, right? Leg, shoulders, back, arms, glutes again, apparently. Um, and then a little bit of like, maybe like a farmer's carry, some kettlebell swings, right? It's not bad, you know, like I don't hate this, um, but it's definitely not taking into account like, you know, um, every aspect of everything. It's, you know, it's gonna miss some components, right? I didn't see any balance work in there, for instance. Um, so integrative training is very comprehensive in that it covers the, all of the aspects of what makes like a really effective athlete. Um, it is also systematic. Um, we are not just, you know, one thing that in that workout I just looked up, it goes straight into things like kettlebell swings, right? It goes straight into, um, you know, some, some of these advanced movements. Well, that's not very systematic, right? We want to make sure that uh, we are, are building a foundation first, and then we are building upon that foundation, and then we're building upon what we built upon, and then we're building upon that, and we're building upon, you know, we're, we're kind of laying the groundwork, and then we're kind of working our way up. This is why NASM utilizes their OP, what we call our OPT model, right? It's a, it's a staircase that you climb up, right? Like you are going to work your way up this, this staircase here from stabilization into power, uh, rather than just like jumping straight to the top, you know, like kettlebell swings are a very explosive, powerful movement. And I'm a huge fan. I freaking love kettlebell work. Absolutely love it. Um, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't do it with someone who, you know, doesn't know how to stabilize their spine properly. Right. I need to make sure that I'm being systematic about how I approach things. Oh, stop. Um, 
It will also develop a high level athlete. Um, so the thing here is that obviously we're focusing on like, you know, creating like the best athletes possible. Um, you know, we are focusing on creating specific workouts. The other thing about like this is like, you know, the version we just talked about, it's a very general workout. Like all those things are good and they all make you like generally more athletic. But if I'm trying to make a golfer, that's going to be a very different workout than uh, a boxer, right? Which is going to be a very different workout from a wide receiver in the NFL. You know, like all three of those people are athletes and they're all going to get workouts that are very specific to them, right? Uh, and then lastly, it's going to be the type of workout that prevents injury rather than, you know, one that causes it, right? Like we're focusing on, uh, you know, really making sure that we're going to prevent injuries. So you're going to see this term, integrated training and, and NASA is absolutely going to ask you the difference between like integrated training versus traditional training um now the term traditional training for those of you uh this is so funny i had a conversation about this recently my roommate loves this book uh it's called the righteous mind um if anybody has read it speak up um i have not read it yet uh but it is apparently a book that's all about like the psychology of why um, some people just can't really get along. It's like why people are divided amongst like politics and people are divided amongst like religion and stuff like that. Um, people have a really hard time seeing eye to eye. Uh, and so the person who wrote this book literally did like MRI imaging on people's brains, asks them like a series of questions and you could see literal physical differences between like, you know, people of different religions, people of different like backgrounds, people of different like, you know, political spectrums and things like that. So the book is all about how like, you know, one of the reasons why we tend to argue the way we do is because like, it is very difficult for us to see eye to eye with others because we are literally programmed not to be able to do that. And so how do you overcome that? Well, there needs to be a focus on other stuff, right? So anyway, uh, <laughs> one of the things that's, that he talks about is how, um, you know, when I say the word like integrated versus the word traditional, you know, this is the type of thing where sometimes like everybody in here, we might have different opinions on which of those sounds like a better training program. Like if I told you I'm going to write you an integrated program and I told you I'm going to write you a traditional program, um, you might find like one of those words a little bit more appealing. Um, and that is so funny because like we were talking about this for like two hours last night. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to kind of shit. I thought that was kind of fun. Um, I don't know about two hours. That sounds like a long conversation. But we, we were definitely talking about like these, these words like traditional is very appealing to some people and other people are like, nah, that doesn't appeal to me. Um, but here's what I will say. There is actually a right answer, uh, not in the real world, but there is a right answer in this course. <laughs> so I am not judging whether or not you want to place emphasis on the word traditional or not. But in this case, integrated training is what NASA wants you to focus on, not traditional training. When they say traditional training, what they're actually talking about is sort of bad training. <laughs> they're kind of talking about like the amateurs in the gym who, you know, maybe they've worked out for a really long time and they figured out what works for them, but that's where the training industry started. You know, that's why it's taught. It's called traditional is because like the, you know, gyms first opened and there were not personal trainers, you know, there were just kind of fitness experts. There were just people who worked out all the time and had really big muscles and were in relatively good shape. Uh, and they would sort of impart their knowledge on to others. You know, that was sort of where, you know, this is like sort of the proto personal trainer. And, you know, it would be people who worked out a lot and they were like, well, this is what worked for me. So therefore you should do it, you know, and that approach doesn't really, you know, kind of breaks down when you think more about it, right? Because obviously, like, you know, your body is very different from mine, what's going to work for me is going to be very different from what works for you. But that's not the approach that people had. What I'm describing right now, that's traditional training, it used to be back in the day. And there came there became like a need for like, actual, like, scientifically trained personal trainers and that's where integrated training as an approach kind of came out you know um something that focused more on what we're seeing right here um integrated training is going to focus on uh what we call functional strength 
rather than just like, you know, gym strength. <laughs> um, so functional strength, what I mean when I say that is it's the type of strength that focuses on all muscle actions. So remember from PFT 101, right? We talked about how there's a difference between, you know, creating force uh, and decelerating force, right? Like if you're, if you are accelerating an object, we call that concentric strength, right? That's the active part of a lift, right? Like if I'm if I got a barbell in my arms and I'm, you know, lifting it up overhead, right? I'm shortening my deltoid muscles and, you know, moving that barbell upwards. That's concentric um, force production, right? But there's also like decelerating force, right? There's also like lowering that barbell back down towards my chest. That's eccentric strength, right? Um, eccentric strength is, is going to lower that bar back down. So now I'm lengthening my muscle out. I'm producing less force than the barbell. And then obviously there's stabilizing, right? There's, there's isometric strength, which is going to dynamically stabilize our joint in whatever position. So if I decide to hold that barbell up overhead like this, that's an isometric contraction. Traditional strength training programs didn't focus on that, right? They were often like, they would lift really heavy. A lot of times they only put emphasis on like concentric strengths. They'd be like, Ugh. they'd get it up and then they would just drop that bar back down Ugh. and drop it, right? And it's like, they're only working on one third of the equation, right? Like we want to have strength in all versions. We want to have concentric and eccentric and isometric strength. Also, Integrated training tends to be very multi-planar. That means that we're going to work through all three planes of motion, right? We're going to do movements that are sagittal. We're going to do movements that are frontal. And we're going to do movements that are transverse, right? Uh, we need to be able to work through all of those planes of motion, not just one. But again, go to the gym. What do you see, guys? If you look at the machines at the gym, most of them are very sagittal, right? They're all front to back, you know? Um, you know, things like bicep curls, tricep extensions, lunges, squats, crunches, uh, um, uh, other examples, there's a million examples, uh, you know, even deadlifts, you know, deadlifts are a really good example, uh, any hinging motion, supermans, um, anything that's going front to back, right, that's all the sagittal plane, but what about these side to side movements, what, like, what about like doing like a side shuffle, what about doing like clamshells, you know, what about all the stuff that kind of moves you, in that frontal plane, right? Side lunges, side step up to balances, uh, lateral raises, right? Um, all that frontal plane stuff. And then what about the transverse plane? Like what about like twisting movements, right? Rotator cuff exercises, like medicine ball twist, lunges with a twist, transverse step ups to balance, you know, things that make you work all those stabilizer muscles, you know? integrated training is going to incorporate those things. Whereas traditional training is probably going to be mostly sagittal stuff, you know? Um, so it also, and lastly, and probably most importantly, focuses on developing your client's neuromuscular efficiency. So when I say neuro, this is one of our key terms here, neuromuscular efficiency. You'll notice I actually didn't put it as a definition though, because it's going to come back in a later PowerPoint. Um, but neuromuscular efficiency uh, is developing your client's ability uh, to coordinate the different muscles throughout your body the way that those muscles are meant to be coordinated. So the way I like to say this is it's recruiting the right muscle at the right time for the right amount of force and in the right plane of motion. You know, uh, I'm going to recruit like the muscles in my legs to stabilize my knee uh, and move it through a range of motion that it's supposed to, right? Um, you know, that's, that's really what we're focusing on here when it comes to neuromuscular efficiency. Um, now, again, the flip side of all this, right? That's all integrated training. Integrated training focuses on all this good stuff, right? All three planes of, uh, all three planes of motion, all three muscle actions, uh, focuses on neuromuscular efficiency, moving your muscles the way that they're supposed to move, right? That's integrated training. We're thinking of all of that. Versus traditional training, which tends to be simplified or very, very basic training uh, that lacks specificity, right? Generally, this only focuses on maximal strength gains. And it's, you know, it's where someone's like, you got to lift heavier, right? Um, traditional programs are just all about lifting heavy. And that's the end of that sentence, you know, <laughs> like that's really what they were kind of focused on. Um, 
rather than, you know, uh, what we know, you know, maybe you lift, you know, heavy one day, but then you lift light on another so that you're training different metabolic processes. Um, oftentimes they utilized isolated muscle groups. They really only focus on prime mover strength. Um, you know, they are only focused on like doing the bench press, right. Uh, rather than like any of the accessory stuff that might, uh, support that, um, you know, getting on a, on a leg extension machine to build up your quads rather than doing like a barbell squat, which is going to work everything all at once, you know? Uh, and they tend to be very uniplanar. They tend to, to really kind of focus only on the sagittal plane uh, when it comes to like a strength training program, right? Like I, I kind of already talked about. Uh, and then they only tend to focus on like concentric contractions rather than, you know, our full muscle action spectrum. Um, so that is the difference between integrated and traditional. So for those of you who hear the word traditional and, and you know, might think that that is a very positive thing, uh, it definitely can be, but not in our text. Uh, we want to focus on integrated training rather than traditional training. I want you to think of tra uh, traditional training, think of it as old school pre-science training, okay? Uh, whereas integrated training is definitely not that. So the problem with all of this that we're seeing here is that it's, you know, in a, uh, traditional training is not very functional. It's not multi planner It doesn't use the whole muscle action spectrum. So this is where the need for personal trainers kind of showed up, you know? Um, personal trainers started focusing more on like learning about the science of human movement and, and learning about like what, uh, you know, types of stress being placed on the body would result in, you know, different physiologic adaptations. And so this is where, you know, when it comes to integrated training principles, we have, uh, you know, a couple key terms here. Again, you'll notice these are not in your notes. And it's because I know that these things are actually going to be in your notes um, later. So uh, one of the concepts that we're going to talk about in this course that's actually really important in this course is what is called a stretch shortening cycle. Um, so you want to think of it as sort of, uh, actually, let's see if I can find a picture of this just because I love having mental, uh, love having like a visual aid here. Uh, yeah, that works. Um, so it's sort of this, uh, I would love it if this were actually like a wheel. I'd love it if it would go, you know, if there was an arrow going back from three back to one. Um, but here we go. This is what a stretch shortening cycle is, right? Uh, you have a stretch in a muscle, that muscle freaks out because it got stretched so rapidly. So then that muscle decides to contract in response in order to protect itself. Remember, stretching is pulling your muscle fibers apart, right? So when you stretch a muscle fiber, your nervous system goes, whoa, you might tear us, right? It might tear, it thinks it's going to tear in half. So what it does is it instinctively sort of rebounds back in the opposite direction. Well, that rebounding action is a shortening, right? That's a contraction of a muscle. So if you rapidly stretch, right, she's standing here. She rapidly stretches herself down into a squat. That's going to load a whole bunch of power into those quad muscles, which will then shorten in response. You can kind of see it, right? See how this is kind of pulled thin and long. And then like, you know, she jumps and now suddenly it's, it's a shortened kind of thickened muscle fiber right there. That's what we see in plyometrics. So, you know, a stretch shortening cycle, um, you can see, you know, here, if he, if he drops here, that lengthens out his muscle fibers. So then they want to shorten in response. So he gets a big jump out afterwards. Um, really important when it talks to athletes, right? So it is an active stretch or an active eccentric contraction of a muscle uh, followed by an immediate shortening of that same muscle. So you rapidly lengthen it. It responds by rapidly shortening. Uh, and that causes you to jump with lots of explosive force uh, and you're able to, you know, do a much more explosive contraction. If you're an athlete, this is what we call, uh, you know, uh, the jump cut, right? Um, so we see like a, let's see here. Uh, athlete. So when you see something like this, right? Um, an athlete might be jogging. See how he did like, you know, he's got a little bit of speed. Okay. Well, those are actually all specific jumps. Uh, this is training for jump cuts. Um, but that little, like little juke that he does, right? Like as he's sprinting, uh, wait for it here, let him reset. 
So he sprints and then he does this little stutter step here. That gives him more power when he jumps the other way because he basically, uh, he's basically like lengthening some of his muscles. That gives him a more explosive uh, jump to the side there, right? And then he's kind of training for those jump cuts. Um, so that's a version of that. You'll also see, uh, I want to find one that's like sort of, well, now I want to see this Le'Veon Bell video. <laughs> um, no, no, this is one of those slow breakdowns that people do. Oh, I hate videos like this. All right. Uh, anyway, um, so a jump cut might be like, where you are maybe doing like a slow jog, you give yourself a little jump. And then with that, what that causes is like when you hit the ground, the landing part rapidly lengthens out your muscles, which makes them want to spring in response. And you use that as your advantage because then you are able to jump much more explosively afterwards. So uh, you are taking advantage of stretch shortening cycles, right? The stretch reflex stores a bunch of potential energy. Uh, which is going to allow you to become like very explosive. Uh, and then you are able to uh, explode and concentrically accelerate out of that much, much, much more quicker, which for an athlete is a big deal, right? Um, and this basically increases your force production in your muscles. Uh, now, I will say this about plyometrics. Um, Dalen, you were asking about getting your um, getting your dunk back, right? Um uh, we were talking about this yesterday. You're trying to trying to, trying to get back uh, up over top of the rim, right? Um, well, one of the ways that you can do that is by training for these stretch shortening cycles, right? And so you do like a little hop, and then that gives you more explosive to kind of get up afterwards. Um, the one thing about plyometrics, though, that we should be aware of, guys, uh, is they're really great at improving your force production. They're really great at including your explosiveness. Uh, they are not so good at improving your muscle size. Uh, plyometrics are not very good for hypertrophy. So for those of you who, you know, might be training like a bodybuilder um, who's trying to get really big, Plyometrics are definitely not the way to go. They make you stronger without making you bigger um, because this is much more of a nervous system strength situation than it is a, a muscular size situation. Um, again, there's a little bit of, you know, the traditional training program wouldn't kind of focus on stuff like that. So uh, when we talk about like, you know, integrated training programs, right, we sort of have our integrated training continuum here. Um, basically, what we are focusing on is we are trying to develop a high level of all components of a training program. Again, core training, balance training, reactive training, chest, shoulders, back, biceps, triceps, legs, right, all of the different components, flexibility, cardio, right, all of it, we're considering all of that. Um, we are also targeting muscle synergies to work together. You know, we don't just want our quads to get overdeveloped and our hamstrings to get weak. We want those two things to work together, right? Um, so the quads are working with the glutes, which are working with the hamstrings, which are working with the calves, right? All of that's all coming together uh, in a synergistic pattern. And we're focusing on functional movement patterns, patterns that actually move, you know, our athletes the way they are designed to move, right? Uh, a squat that doesn't involve an excessive forward lean, a pushing and pulling that doesn't involve shoulder elevation. All of that is going to give us a much greater training response if we put all of those things together. So we're training in like, uh, so we're training in all planes of motion, sagittal, frontal, and transverse, right? You can see those three planes right here. Uh, the frontal plane dividing us into a front and back half. So they are movements where we are sliding along that plane like this, right? We're doing side to side movements. We got the sagittal plane, which is dividing us into left and right halves like this. Those are movements that are front to back. And we've got transverse plane movements, which are the twisting side to side actions, right? Uh, we are also making sure that we are always, always, always training our clients with optimum posture. So we are focusing on uh, you know, developing those, you know, remember we talked about length tension relationships, right? We want to have muscles on both sides of a joint pulling equally rather than one muscle pulling uh, in either direction, right? So when they pull equally, that bone stays in optimum alignment. We are training with proper posture. 
Um, so here's a good example of that, right? She's got a great, you know, uh, you know, lumbar pelvic hip posture here, right? She's got great, she's got level shoulders, level hips. Her knees are directly lined up with her toes. Um, and we can see like, you know, really great alignment here as well with those parallel lines. Um, so talking about those length tension relationships, right? We want to make sure that our muscles are aligned at their optimal length, right? The resting length tension relationship is the resting length of a muscle and the amount of tension that it can produce at that resting length, right? A muscle that is too lengthened, a muscle that's too long, right? Uh, if we see a muscle that is, you know, over shortened, this muscle cannot produce as much force as it's supposed to. If a muscle is over lengthened, that muscle cannot produce as much force as it's supposed to, right? We're seeing sort of, you know, not enough overlap of actin and myosin fibers in an underactive muscle. We're seeing too much overlap of actin and myosin fibers in an overactive muscle. Um, you know, it's a Goldilocks situation, right? Like we're, you know, this porridge here is just right. <laughs> we got plenty of overlap. We've also got plenty of room to move. That is an ideal length tension relationship, right? This is what we're looking for. So, you know, uh, we are going to train our clients um, to fix their overactive muscles by stretching them. And we're going to train our clients to fix their underactive muscles by strengthening them. Um, so we are also going to be looking at some terms here uh, in order to take advantage of these principles that we are talking about, right? Um, training for muscle balances, right? Um, a shortened muscle, a muscle that is, you know, overly overactive, right? Um, by the way, guys, just really quickly, just because I'm starting to feel a little uncomfortable about it, we got a lot of bold terms in the PowerPoint. I know they're not in your notes right now. I know I'm moving without like the notes here they come up in later PowerPoints. You actually don't want them in your notes yet because they're not as applicable. I want them to help you on homework too. <laughs> um, so for those of you who are getting like a little itchy right now, who are like, why are we moving through this PowerPoint if we're not taking notes? This is why, trust me, it's coming up. <laughs> um, I always remember this. Is, this is like, I don't know who wrote these PowerPoints, but I, I know that they, I know that they all come up again. So um, anyway. Uh, so training for optimum posture, right? Uh, we talk about like how this got this way, right? Like what's happening? Why is this not so good for us? Well, this overactive muscle, which is pulling too much is causing what we call altered reciprocal inhibition, right? So remember reciprocal inhibition, it's how your nervous system works. When you like, if I'm trying to bob my head side to side like this, right? Reciprocal inhibition is allowing that to happen. When I contract this trap muscle and it pulls me this way, this trap muscle relaxes. And then my brain goes, okay, well now I wanna go the other way. So it contracts this side and it releases this side. That's reciprocal inhibition. The left is reciprocating the right. You know, uh, when the, you know, this traffic going this way has a red light, you know, this traffic going this way has a green light, right? Um, that's reciprocating each other. That way they don't <laughs> collide into each other. Or in this case, my muscles don't pull at the same time. Um, but that can get messed up, right? You have altered reciprocal inhibition. Altered reciprocal inhibition is where a tight muscle decreases the other muscle's ability to contract. So this muscle here, this overactive muscle, uh, this big fat muscle here is, is inhibiting this underactive muscle from being able to contract. So basically if I contracted my left, you know, trap muscle all day, and then I tried to like move to my right, I'd be like, <clears throat> I wouldn't be able to move. Right. So that is kind of what we're seeing here, right? We're seeing this sort of altered reciprocal inhibition action. Um, where one muscle is keeping the other muscle from being able to contract. Well, now another muscle is going to try to come in and try to take over. And that is going to usually be in the, in the case of a synergist muscle. So now a synergist muscle is going to come in and be like, oh, you couldn't get the job done. Let me help, right? So now a synergistic muscle starts to take over for a weakened prime mover. The muscle that was supposed to be doing its job, it isn't doing its job because it's being inhibited by its sort of exact opposite. So now a helper muscle comes in. This is where when you see someone's knees cave in, 
right? When we see like knee valgus in someone who's squatting, right? Um, you know, we see this situation. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I love this picture. Uh, we see this situation right here, right? This person's knees caving in like this. What's happening is his glute is being inhibited uh, by some muscle, right? By, by a tight antagonist muscle. So now it's not able to do its job the way it's supposed to. Um, so what's happening is like the, the, probably the adductors, right? These inner thigh muscles are turning the glute off, right? Or maybe hip flexors are turning the glute off. So now it's not able to do its job. So synergist muscles, um, the, you know, agon, you know, the, uh, the, the adductor muscles, or maybe the TFL, they're contracting and that's causing the posture to alter during this movement. They're not able to move the way that they are supposed to. So that is what we are seeing uh, in these overactive, underactive situations. This is what we need to look at, right? Um, so the gluteus maximus, right? We need to train the gluteus maximus uh, to work in all planes of motion because it can work through all planes of motion, right? Your glute can perform hip extension. That's the sagittal plane. It can perform a little bit of abduction, not a lot, but a little bit of abduction, right? Uh, that's the frontal plane. And it needs to be able to do transverse movements as well, right? It needs to be able to do hip external rotation, which is transverse. So we need to train it through all three planes of motion. We also need to train it to be able to shorten and contract. We need to train it to be able to lengthen and relax. And we need to train it to isometrically hold and stabilize. That's the integrated approach that we're talking about. Um, so how do we do all this? How do we actually write a workout that is integrated? Well, those of you who have been through our program design classes before, you will know that that is why NASM created their OPT template. So uh, Lorianne, I remember uh, we had a moment uh, a few uh, weeks ago where we talked about fitness assessments and I was building workouts and you were like, I don't know how to read this template. We're moving really fast. Guess what? Today is the example. <laughs> um, it happens to everybody, right? I always, I always warn it. And then Bay, we had the same, you know, it happens to everybody, right? Like we always, it's all the, you know, first mod's always a little rough guys, but here it is. Here's your, here's your explanation. So the integrated approach, how do we make sure that we're working through all planes of motion? How do we make sure that we are working through all muscle actions? How do we train everything? Well, we use this workout template here. Uh, we're going to focus on the warm up stuff, which is going to be where we address your flexibility training, right? We're going to address poor flexibility. We're going to address muscle imbalances. If I know you've got a tight muscle on one side of the joint, what am I going to do? I'm going to untighten that muscle, right? I'm going to get it to, to relax a little bit, right? So I'm going to use static stretches sometimes if it's appropriate, or maybe with a different client, I'll use active stretches. Or maybe with a different client, I'll use dynamic stretches, right? So actually, I'm going to close this here because I got a better version over here. Uh, is it this one? No. Uh, sorry, I've got a I've got a thing I want to open. Uh, where is it? Oh no. Um, no. <laughs> God dang it. Sorry. One second, guys. I got a, I got a sheet that has them all. Um, no, that's that one. I need to label these better. <laughs> Ow. God, did I not keep it on my computer here? All right. Well, we'll go with this version here. Um, all right, so uh, in the warm up section, right, which uh, you can kind of see here, but it doesn't have the, the table, you know, uh, you're going to do, you're, you're going to address the flexibility, right? Uh, we've got stabilization exercises, we've got strength uh, exercises, we've got power exercises. <clears throat> With clients and stabilization, we're going to do static stretches. With clients and strength, we're going to do active stretches. And with clients and power, we're going to do dynamic stretches. So on the OPT template, which we see here, right? We are going to address by doing things like self-myofascial release. 
right? Which is, you know, more commonly referred to as SMR. That's going to be things like, you know, foam rolling, or maybe it'll be using like a tiger tail or a theracane, uh, or maybe like a massage gun, right? Any of those like little tools that kind of just, you know, work in and like massage the body, right? All that stuff, that's all examples of self myofascial release. Um, you are, are, you know, releasing your muscles uh, by giving yourself a little massage, right? Like, uh, here, one second. This is my little, you know, massage gun tool here. This is the one I like, right? Um, so if I grab this thing and I, you know, adjust it and turn its little thing on and I go like this, you know, sounds like a freaking power tool. This is a very cheap one, <laughs> which is why it's so freaking loud, uh, but it gets the job done. Um, so this is like a little massage tool that is meant to, you know, kind of release your muscles. Um, so I'm going to use that uh, as my version of self myofascial release, or maybe I get on a foam roller, right? And then I'm going to follow that up with either static stretches um, or active stretches or dynamic stretches, right? All of those are going to be uh, really good options. Yeah, it's it's crazy loud. Uh, <laughs> it's th the thing is, this is a ripoff of uh, what's called the Tim Tam which is also known for being very loud. Um, but like the Tim Tam is the expensive like $500 one. This thing's like 120 bucks. Um, the Tim Tam was loud, but you know, it was the actual name brand model. This is a ripoff version. So it only got louder. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so anyway, that's self myofascial release. Uh, then we got static, we got active, we got different types of stretches. It depends on where our client is in, in their program, uh, depending on what type of stretch we're going to give them. And then we're going to follow that up with a little bit of cardio, right? You know, we want to make sure that we have cardiorespiratory training uh, that improves endurance, but also doesn't overtrain our clients. So maybe we have like cardio training uh, that is either stage one or stage two. Uh, or stage three, right? And stage one, you know, we know that that's the type of cardio training that uses about 65 to 75% of your heart rate max. Stage two, uh, that's going to use different zones uh, to sort of introduce the concept of interval training. So we're going to go from 65 all the way up to about 85% of your heart rate max. So it's a much wider range. Stage three, all the way from 65, maybe up to 95. So we go really high in that version. So that is, uh, that is our general like sort of cardio training approach to things. Integrated training is also going to train our clients for, you know, developing their core, right? Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing core training, uh, you know, in our, our sort of movement prep here, right? Um, so core, you know, exercises. Um, uh, maybe that's going to be either stabilization version, strength version, or, or power versions. We're also going to do uh, a little bit of balance training, right? We're going to develop uh, our neuromuscular efficiency with balance exercises. Uh, and then we've got clients who are maybe going to do, you know, explosive plyometric training. That is our reactive training, right? The really explosive stuff, box jumps, squat jumps, you know, all the really explosive. Uh, so plyometric exercises, right? So that is what we call like sort of our movement prep, right? This section right here. Um, so that's where we're looking at, uh, you know, it's it's out of the warm up, right? We've moved out of the warm up, but we're still not necessarily in to the meat and potatoes of our workout just yet, right? Um, so that's that's our core balance and reactive. An integrated program will also include a little bit of SAQ training if it's applicable to your client. So when we look at SAQ, that stands for, you know, speed exercises. That's the S. Uh, it stands for agility exercises. And it stands for quickness exercises. So I want to teach my client how to move in one direction as fast as possible. I want to teach them how to change direction as fast as possible. Uh, and I want to help them like be able to react to something as fast as possible. Uh, 
total bragging moment, but I was at Ultima yesterday and uh, this freaking guy, uh, Donnie, who is just a monster on the field. Like this guy is so good. Um, you know, uh, I saw him. So there's a, there's a thing in Ultimate, the way it works um, is we play what's called last back. And what last back is, is if the other team scores and you have to jog back to your end zone and someone else is sitting on the sidelines, they can yell last back. And what they'll do is they'll come in, whoever's last then goes out. And so it's how you determine like who's going on and off the field. Um, so uh, then what happens, you're lined up because the defense changed and the offense changed. Um, what you'll do is you just look across the field and you line up for whoever you want to guard. And I saw Donnie like specifically move to me. And I was like, what are you trying to be, you trying to be cocky here? You're saying you want to guard me? Like, I don't want anyone to want to guard me. I want, you know, I want it to be a chore. So like immediately, you know, we start this play and I was like, I'm going to burn him. You know, <laughs> like, I was like, I gotta, I gotta make sure he doesn't ever want to guard me again. And so sure enough, like, my buddy Matt, who I know is a really good, like long bomb, he gets it. And I just turned and sprinted as fast as possible and, you know, burned the heck out of him and made like an, you know, like a, like a 50, you know, 50 yard catch. It was really fun. <laughs> um, and I was like, that's right. <laughs> like, you better not want to guard me anymore. You know? <laughs> this should be a chore, not a privilege, you know? <laughs> um, that is like my favorite moment of yesterday. Uh, but that is very much like a speed thing, right? I did not change direction. I literally just ran as fast as possible in one straight line. Um, that's speed. Now, on the flip side, if I had instead decided to like run to the left and then run to the right and then run to the left and then run to the right and just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, that is a very directional change thing that's an agility situation. So if I was running this way and then I stopped, turned around and ran back, um, that would be an agility drill, right? And then there's quickness drills. Now quickness drills are the ones where it's based on reaction time. So let's say like uh, someone throws you a pass and you aren't looking at it, you're just running to where, you know, you look at it and you think you know where it's going and then you run it down and then you turn at the last second, you have to respond. You're like, oh, there it is. And then you have to catch it and pull it in. That's a quickness drill. Or let's say you're guarding someone else and you see that person run to the left. You are gonna in turn respond and you're gonna run to the left. And all of a sudden they run to the right. And then you're gonna see that and be like, ah, they're changing directions. Then you're gonna run to the right. So you're gonna juke back and forth and back and forth in response to someone else. You are responding to an external stimulus. That's quickness. So like a boxer, right, who has a punch coming at their face and they turn and then it goes over their shoulder, right? That's a quickness drill, right? They are responding to an external stimulus, right? Uh, the best example of quickness I can give you guys, I'm sure you guys have seen this before, but uh, this freaking clip this is incredible. This is the best example of quickness in sports history. It has to be. You can't touch this. Oh, that's, <laughs> I didn't know they were going to play this song. That's hilarious. OK, uh, here we go. You can't touch this. <laughs> you can't touch this. He never hits him. You can't touch this. Incredible. <laughs> in freaking credible. Um, just miss, miss, dodge, miss, dodge. Oh, it's amazing. Muhammad Ali was the man. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> that's so funny. Um, I, <laughs> so anyway, I, I thought it was gonna be like, a, I thought it was gonna be boxing commentary. Um, so that is part of an integrated training program as well. And I'm spending a little bit of extra time on this. I know I usually move through SAQ pretty quick, but this is obviously a big deal in a sports performance setting, right? Um, the ability to change direction as quick as possible is, is really what we're looking for. Um, and then 
we have integrated strength. So now finally, you know, like uh, we just talked about traditional programs. They were all about max strength all the time. And we really haven't been talking about strength. We've been talking about flexibility. We've been talking about speed. We've been talking about, you know, uh, uh, balance. We've been talking about, you know, all these things that aren't even related to strength. Now, finally, at the end, we can get to the meat and potatoes, you know, total body strength, right? Total body exercises, um, chest exercises, back exercises, uh, bice, uh, shoulder exercises, biceps exercises, triceps exercises, and then obviously, most importantly, uh, leg exercises, right? Freaking don't skip leg day. Uh, so that's our resistance section, right? Um, this is where we look at our total body strength, not doing the classic, like, you know, Monday morning, it's chest day, right? And you show up for your chest stuff. And then, you know, Wednesday is supposed to be back day and, you know, you've lost motivation. So you skip it. And then leg day, it's like, well, that never happens. And you go back for chest day on Monday, you know, <laughs> like not just working one muscle group because it's your vanity muscles and it's your favorite, right? We got to look at everything. Um, so when it comes to integrated training, what are our goals? Injury prevention should always be number one, decreasing body fat's helpful, increased lean muscle mass, and improve all of the components of what makes a very strong athlete. That is what we are gonna talk about over the next 10 days. So it needs to, above it all, everything else, it always needs to be safe. It needs to be progressive. It needs to focus on neural adaptations. And we always, 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 when we are writing a program, focus on quality over quantity. And that is the sort of intro chapter you know, that's NASM patting themselves on the back <laughs> uh, for writing a good program. Uh, any questions on chapter one, guys? Everybody feeling pretty good? Yep. yep. Love it, love it. All righty. Um, so let's go ahead and go back through. You will notice this is actually going to be uh, this pretty similar to the PowerPoint that we already went over in this mod. Um, so we're going to review our human movement science. Uh, a lot of this is going to look very familiar. Obviously, you know, the chapter is really, if you open your book, you'll be like, yeah, you know, and then you compare it to your regular and you're like, these are quite similar. <laughs> uh, you definitely gonna see some serious, uh, some serious similarities here. Um, but let's look at uh, sort of introducing uh, sort of the human movement science here. I mean, not introducing, it's not an intro for you guys, but the chapter is called Introduction to Human Movement Science. Um, so human movement science, right? We've, we've talked about this before. This is the study of biomechanics, right? Um, so we are going to be studying the, the muscular system, right? Um, obviously, we're looking at muscular anatomy, uh, all of the muscles in the body, agonists, antagonists, uh, synergists, stabilizers, right? Uh, looking at all those different muscles. Uh, and then we are also going to be looking at uh, the articular side of things. So we're going to look at like our joints and how those move. Uh, and then we are also going to be looking at the nervous system and how that moves, right? So the three components of our kinetic chain, right? You've got the muscular system, the skeletal system, and the nervous system. The nervous system controls the muscular system to move the skeletal system. That's why we call it a chain, right? If any of those components are jacked up, none of them are going to work, right? So we need to study this stuff, and that is where the science of biomechanics comes in, right? Uh, you guys have heard me say, bio, you know, we've, we've put this in our notes before, but biomechanics, it is the study of how the human body interacts with both internal forces and external forces, right? It's how your nervous system is able to control your muscular system to move your skeletal system the way it's supposed to, <laughs> right? And it's also how it sort of over, you know, interacts with the external environment, right? Like I got my bowl of cereal here, right? So how am I applying just enough force to kind of move this bowl around? Um, you know, that is the study of biomechanics. How much force does it need to create to kind of, you know, overcome some external stimulus, but also how is it working internally in order to do that, right? Um, so 
Uh, in order to understand this, first thing we need to understand is how our body moves through these three very specific planes of motion. Um, so these are three imaginary planes that are kind of positioned at right angles within the body that are dividing the body in half, uh, in half in very three, three very different ways. So uh, predominantly movement is going to take place in usually like one main plane. Right. So for instance, like in the sat, you know, if, if I'm moving my, my arms like this, right, you know, this is primarily the sagittal plane. Now, is there an argument to be made that there's some transverse movement happening there? Yeah, sure. Right. Like my arms are kind of, I'm not exactly, you know, I'm kind of moving at an angle. It gets a little more narrow towards the top, a little wider down below because I'm trying not to hit these little sharp things that always cut me on the sides of my chair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, by the way, if you don't like having arms on your chair, don't just rip them off. Uh, it will make sharp little things that you have to deal with forever. Uh, <laughs> so that's, you know, this is primarily a sagittal movement, but uh, there's probably a little bit of twisting that happens there. Maybe there's a little frontal plane movement that's occurring, right? But primarily, guys, when movement occurs, usually it pretty much occurs mostly in one plane. Um, so we've got the sagittal plane. Like I said, that's going to the sagittal plane is going to divide us. Um, actually, am I going to see this on the next slide? Hold on one second. Let me skip forward. Yeah, no. Um, so when we look at our planes of motion, uh, you can see the sagittal plane divides us into uh, left and right halves. Ooh, that's low res. Hold on. There we go. Um, oh, that. Ah. Come on, internet, hook me up. Give me a high quality picture. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I've pulled this one up before. This one's great. There we go. So the, the sagittal plane divides us into a left and right half, right? So you can see cutting me down the middle like this. So again, any movement where I'm going front to back is going to be sagittal plane movements. Now, the movements that we refer to when we're talking about that are going to be flexion and extension. Those are the type of movements that occur in the sagittal plane. So we have got, you know, the joint that we're talking about in this case, it would be my elbow, elbow flexion or elbow extension. So flexion, extension, flexion, extension, shoulder flexion, shoulder extension, shoulder flexion, shoulder extension, hip flexion, hip extension, right? So uh, all of those things are uh, frontal plane movements. When you think about walking, right? Uh, you know, if you look at like the biomechanics of walking, or even you know, or or yeah, uh, or running, um, you know, you think about it, right? Here's like a, you know the process of walking, right? The ankle goes into dorsiflexion during the heel strike, and then performs plantar flexion as it goes through like the toe off position, right? So at the same time at the knee, right? You are gonna perform like, you can see like hip, flex, uh, hip flexion, right? There's hip flexion there. There's knee extension and ankle uh, dorsiflexion that, land, that causes us to land. Then we are gonna move through that stance as the hip goes into hip extension. The knee is going to bend. So that's going to be knee flexion. Uh, and then the foot and ankle complex is going to go through ankle plantar flexion. So there it is, right? We see like, you know, these three different sort of uh, uh, sections to a movement there, right? Those are all, that's why this is a very sagittal plane movement. So flexion and extension only occur in the sagittal plane. Uh, but then we've also got the frontal plane, which divides the body into uh, front and back halves, right? So there's your frontal plane. So these are movements that move along the plane like this. So these are our side to side movements, right? The frontal plane stuff. So if I did like lateral flexion, which is this movement here, or if I did abduction, or if I did adduction, right? Those are all frontal plane movements. Um, so the big ones are adduction and abduction. And then one of the less common ones is, is lateral flexion, which is this here. Um, you'll notice that like all these movements have an opposite, right? Because we have to move one way and then we have to be able to get back the other way. Flexion's opposite is extension. Plantar flexion's opposite is dorsiflexion. 
abduction's opposite is adduction, you will notice that there is no opposite to lateral flexion. Uh, that's because like me going to the right is lateral flexion, but me going to the left is also lateral flexion. Um, it's the same muscle. Like the anti, you know, a lot of times, like you know, the agonist for fl uh, for elbow flexion is the biceps. The agonist for elbow extension is the tricep. They're different muscles, right? Well, lateral flexion is caused by like my right QL. Well, guess what? Lateral flexion is caused by my left QL. So you know, um, that's why these don't. That's why that one doesn't have like a an opposite term. Is because it's the same muscle just you know, on the other side of the joint, you know, because we're symmetrical um, for the most part. Our muscles are symmetrical. Uh, inside, it's a mess. Uh, <laughs> inside, it's a mess is the name of my emo band, by the way. Uh, <laughs> then we got the transverse plane. Um, that's a dumb joke. Uh, we got the transverse plane, which is going to divide the body into upper and lower halves. Uh, that's what we're going to see here, right? Cutting us down the middle, right? So transverse movements are things like rotation, right? If you were to chop my head right here, uh, and then I was sliding it like that, or, you know, movements like this where I'm sliding, you know, uh, on like, a, you know, creating a rotary movement here, right? If you were to like take, my, you know, if I had a dumb, if I had like a marker and I was standing in a circular room and I drew along the wall here, you know, and then went like that, right? It would create sort of this, this, circle circular action right well that's that's the transverse plane um so the transverse plane you know we've got internal rotation which would be a movement like this i'd be rotating toward my midline uh and i've got external rotation which would be rotating like this i'd be rotating away from my midline uh and then i've got horizontal adduction which would be adding to my middle and i've got horizontal abduction which would be abducting away from my middle um, so those are our transverse movements, right? So those are the main movements that we're talking about. So you think about like, you know, flexion extension, that's a lot of, you know, like, uh, your squats, your lunges, your step up to balance abduction and adduction. That's things like, uh, lateral lunges or lateral raises. Uh, you've got internal and external rotation movements, which often we call just cable external rotation or cable internal rotation. Um, you've got horizontal abduction, uh, which would be like a rowing movement like this. Um, but then you've got uh, horizontal adduction, which would be a chest press movement like that. Um, lots of lots of fun, fun, different movements here. Uh, now, you do have some combined joint actions. You got some special terms. You guys heard me uh, uh, mentioned dorsiflexion and plantar flexion earlier. Those are really just ankle versions of uh, flexion and extension, but there are some combined joint actions which are kind of weird, right? So for instance, uh, combined joint actions might be things like pronation and supination. These terms are huge. Actually, hold on just a second. Where's my scapular stuff? I must skip it in this book, that's weird. Um, Quickly, something that's not in the PowerPoint. I do want to mention the scapular movements, uh, just because they are really important. Um, that's so weird. I, I didn't know these weren't in the PowerPoint. Um, I wonder if that slide got deleted somehow. Uh, so scapular uh, elevation would be moving your shoulder blades up like this, right? If I took my scapula and I pulled it upwards, right? That's scapular elevation. Pulling them downwards, that would be scapular depression, right? Uh, bringing it around the front of my body, that would be scapular protraction. And then I've got scapular retraction. Okay, so those are the movements in your shoulder blade. Your shoulder blade is very, very unique. So it gets four of its own sort of unique names for movements and stuff. Um, there's actually other ones too. There's rotation, but we don't worry about those. Uh, yeah, so then combine joint actions in the foot and ankle. The foot and ankle is, is the most important, well, I don't know about that, it, it's a, but it is a very, very important joint to talk about, right? So you have got ankle pronation, which is a combo movement. So in your ankle, uh, if we look at it, uh, we see ankle dorsiflexion, okay? So ankle dorsiflexion would be pulling your toe towards your face, right? This is dorsiflexion right here. We're also going to see ankle e, uh, eversion, okay? Ankle eversion 
uh, is where you are showing the outside of your foot away from your midline, okay? Um, so you're, you're basically showing the, the bottom of your foot, right, uh, towards the outside section here. Um, that's not it. Come on, I just want it by itself. Ah, there we go. So that's E version. Um, so we see E version is sort of moving it away. So E version is a frontal plane movement. Dorsiflexion is a sagittal plane movement. But then we're also going to see ankle external rotation. So we're also going to see, I'm never going to get a picture of this by itself. <laughs> oh, actually, there we go. Uh, a little bit right here. This is kind of a hard to see picture, but we're also going to see external rotation of the ankle where it's, oh, there we go, where it turns away from your midline. Now, if you take all three of those things and you put them together, the external rotation, the dorsiflexion, and the eversion, you have what is called ankle pronation. Okay. Ankle pronation is a combination of all of those things together. You can see here's a neutral ankle, right? This is pronated. The foot is slightly curling upwards. It is slightly externally rotating and the inside arch is collapsing. So they have movement in all three planes simultaneously, creating way too much pronation here. This right here, this posture right here is the leading cause of ankle sprains. Um, and ankle sprains are an injury that is super, super common in the sports world. It also causes problems in the knees, which causes problems in the hips. So that pronation is a combination of ankle eversion, dorsiflexion, and external rotation. Uh, and that will lead to uh, ugh, no pronation distortion. That will lead to pronation distortion syndrome. So we'll see someone who stands with this sort of pronation distortion syndrome. Uh, all right, let's try this. Oh, help me out, internet. <laughs> there we go. Um, you'll see somebody who looks like this, right? The knees are caving in. They are, uh, they are kind of collapsing on the inside of their feet. Right, the knee, the knees are actually lined up. Look at how her kneecap lines up like inside of her foot on both sides, right? Rather than here, where you can see they're lining up with like her, and that's lining up with her big toe, but this one over here is doing a pretty good job lining up their second and third toe. So we're seeing that sort of knees caving in, sort of there we go. That's what I want. Uh, this posture right here, right? That's pronation of the ankle, which causes rotation in the tibia which causes rotation in the, in the uh, femur. So not awesome, right? Now there is also excessive supination as well. Uh, it is way more rare. I'm gonna have a hard time actually finding a good picture of this. Um, but if we look at like uh, over supination of the ankle, it'll look something kind of like this. Um, oh, actually, there we go. Yeah, there's too much supination. Right. So this is somebody who has like high arches, right? They are not doing ankle eversion. Uh, they're doing ankle inversion. They're not doing dorsiflexion. They're doing plantar flexion. They are not doing external rotation. They're doing internal rotation. So that is, you know, the difference here. We see pronation of the ankle and we see supination of the ankle, right? Both of those lead to injuries. Both are not awesome. This one's way more rare. You don't see a lot of people with supination. Um, but if you ever see like knee varus, where you see somebody who has like, uh, sort of like that bow legged posture, um, you know, actually there we go. Right. Uh, you can say, kind of see like their knees are actually kind of bowing away from their midline, right? That's actually an example of like, you know, somebody who is doing too much supination. Like I said, not very, oh, there we go. Look at that bow legged, right? Uh, not very common. You don't see this very often, but it, but it can happen. Uh, especially if it's like somebody who, you know, has like rickets or something, um, that will definitely occur. 
So uh, that is pronation versus supination. Pronation often leads to lateral ankle sprains. Over supination can lead to uh, medial and high ankle sprains. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to see. Um, now, talking about uh, the muscle action spectrum, you guys will remember, we said we want to train our clients through all three muscle actions, right? We don't just want to be able to produce force. We also want to be able to reduce force. We want to be able to stabilize force, right? So looking at this, our, we've got three muscle contractions, eccentric, isometric, and concentric. So eccentric muscle contractions are contractions that occur while your muscle is lengthening. Remember I talked about stretch shortening cycles earlier? This is the start of a stretch shortening cycle. It's the lengthening of a muscle, right? So you can think of this as decelerating of force, right? Decelerating muscle. Let's say I'm catching something that's falling from above me, right? If I'm decelerating it, right? That's an eccentric contraction. Uh, or the amount of tension that my muscles are generating is less tension than how much the force is. If I've got a hundred pound barbell in my arms and then I generate, we'll say 95 pounds of force, that barbell is gonna lower down to the ground, right? That's an eccentric contraction. Uh, this is the start of a stretch shortening cycle, right? So this is where you are gonna begin a stretch shortening cycle because you are lengthening out a muscle so that you can rapidly shorten it afterwards. Force reduction. So that's what eccentric contractions are, right? Isometric contractions are contractions that occur when your muscle doesn't change its length. It stays the exact same length, right? So think of this as force stabilization, right? Uh, the tension that's being generated by your muscle is equal to the tension being generated uh, or the tension being applied to that muscle. So if I have my little bowl here and I just decide to hold this up for the next 20 minutes, which will make my arm burn like crazy, right? If I just hold this here, right? And I'm generating exactly how many pounds of force are equal to this bowl. I'm just going to hold this just like this. That's an isometric contraction. So the tension generated by your muscle is equal to the tension uh, that's being applied to that muscle. Uh, you In a stretch shortening cycle, this is the transitionary phase. So remember, uh, if we look at like a, a, a depth jump, So this is an exercise you can do. Oh, there we go. This is an exercise called the depth jump. Uh, and it is where you can see he is applying a stretch shortening cycle. He lands. Let's play this in ultra slow motion because this guy is super speedy. Um, he is going to jump off. And this is going to cause stretching, right? He has now stretched all these muscles and immediately they all want to lengthen in the opposite direction. So then he is going to accelerate by concentrically producing force afterwards, right? Um, but here's the thing, there was obviously a transition that happened, right? You can even see it, right? He's got a little like transitionary bounce. Watch his Achilles. See that little bounce that happened there, right? That's a transitionary phase. Generally, we think of isometrics as big, long pauses, right? Isometrics, right? You're, you're holding yourself in one spot, right? That is generally what we think of when we hear isometric, right? You think of a big, long hold, a plank, a wall sit, something like that, right? Um, but in this case, the, the isometric uh, section of like an explosive movement, uh, we give it a special term. We call it amortization. Okay. So amortization is the transitional period between when you are lengthening and when you start to shorten. It should be a split second, right? It should be so very short. Um, the longer you take to transfer between one and the other, the more force you are losing, right? So amortization is a special term that we're gonna use when we talk about explosive movements, where it is the transitional period of stabilization that occurs between rapid lengthening and rapid shortening. So 
you probably heard the term amortization, by the way. Uh, if you look at amortization, generally it's a it's a word that's used in the finance world, uh, and it's the time it takes for you to stop losing money before you start gaining money. <laughs> um, so you look at like here's your loan, right? Like this is your your you're basically looking this right here from 2010 to 2031. That's your amortization period, and then suddenly, boom, you're making profit. You know, um, it's the turnaround time of an investment. Uh, well, amortization in the sports world is the turnaround time of a of an athletic movement. Okay, um, but isometric contractions by themselves are the stabilizing movements. Uh, does that make sense to everybody? Is everybody clear on amortization? Everybody got that? Cool. It's kind of a new term. I mean, we've used it before, but you know. Um, all right, and then lastly, we've got the one that everybody wants to get to, uh, you know, the ones that you generally see in the gym, people putting most of their emphasis on, which are your concentric contractions, okay? Your concentric contractions are the positive of a muscle, right? The muscle is, uh, this is a contraction that occurs when a muscle is shortening, right? These are your acceleration oops, movements. Uh, the tension that your muscle is generating is greater than your resistive force. So if I've got 100 pounds in my hands, I generate 100 pound, 101 pounds of force, right? I overcome that movement and I move the barbell upwards. Um, this is the last part of a stretch shortening cycle. This is the, the unloading phase, right? Um, you know, we're unloading an explosive movement. So if I had a football in my arm, and I want to like be really explosive, right? This is why like they talk about like snapping your arm. You know, quarterbacks when they have like a football, for two reasons they hold the football here like this. They don't hold it up here, right? Number one, it's more protected in this position. Uh, but number two, when they grab that, when they move from here to here, and then they throw it, it gives them more of a snap. They get a stretch shortening cycle, right? They stretch, and then they shorten. And so by keeping it close to your ear and snapping it like that, you're going to have a much better throw. Uh, he's back in the news right now. This is just for all my football heads out there. But he's back in the news now, Tim Tebow, right? Because um, he's playing tight end for the Jaguars, or at least, you know, he's trying to. Um, the reason, I swear, the reason he didn't uh, make it in the NFL, because he won games. You know, he was actually like statistically a pretty good quarterback. So it's like, why didn't someone pick him up? Two reasons. Number one, he was a media frenzy, which no one wants to deal with. Um, same thing with like, uh, I can't remember his name, Sam something or other uh, from a few years ago, who was like a cornerback. Um, uh, so he's a media frenzy. No one was interested. Uh, but number two, his form when he throws looks terrible. He throws really well. The guy's got a cannon for an arm, but like his mechanics were just awkward looking. And so like all these like football gurus who spend time like analyzing the perfect movements and stuff, this didn't like how he looked, you know, um, which I think is a crappy reason to, you know, again, I, I think it should be results based, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> I always thought he was fun to watch. Um, but he was, he had a really bad, like he never kept the ball near his ear. He would just, you know, it was all over the place. Um, and so it freaked people out and didn't look like he had a good stretch shortening cycle. For the record, don't take throw, football throwing advice from me. I wasn't allowed to play football as a kid. So I actually can't throw a spiral to save my life, but, <laughs> uh, I know how stretch shortening cycles work. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Here's some more terms. Like I said, I told you these were going to come up. Um, length tension relationship. This is obviously very, very important. When we talk about like functional anatomy and we talk about proper alignment and posture and things like that, we are talking about ideal length tension relationships, right? Uh, which again, we said it earlier, it's the resting length of a muscle and the amount of tension that it can generate at that resting length. Uh, it is the optimal overlap with your actin and myosin fibers. So when you have that, you have ideal posture, right? Your shoulders aren't rounded because this muscle's pulling too much and this muscle's not pulling enough. They are both pulling equally, which is keeping you in ideal alignment, right? 
Um, now, another term that you're going to see that's related to the sports world uh, that we have also talked about in the past is what's called a force velocity curve. Uh, and this basically states that like uh, the ability of the muscles to generate force with an increasing amount of velocity. So basically think of force as how much weight something is. Think of velocity as how fast something moves. Now, you cannot have a lot of force and a lot of velocity. They are sort of backwards of each other. If my force goes up, my velocity goes down. The heavier something is, the slower I'm going to move. The lighter something is, the faster I'm going to move. So these two concepts have an inverse relationship. Force is how much something weighs. Velocity is the speed at which it is traveling. So Dalen, yesterday, we, again, we were talking about dunking, right? So what would be better to make you, you know, be able to dunk? Lifting really heavy or lifting really explosively? Well, the answer is we want to actually train for both. If we can develop a high level of force and separately on a different training day or maybe in a different set, we can train for a high amount of velocity. We'll increase both of those things. And even though they have an inverse relationship, your overall power output will go up right and that's what we do we want to so if we want to get better at dunking we want to do heavy squats and pair that up with light squats that are explosive um for those of you who have actually been through program design already you've seen us talk about this this is where you do a superset where you maybe do like a shoulder press with really heavy weight for like five repetitions and then you rack it and grab two really light dumbbells and you explode and do like a push press. So now I'm training for high force and high velocity. That's gonna make me a more explosive athlete. So we are taking advantage of this force velocity curve, right? Force and velocity have an inverse relationship. High force equals low velocity. High velocity equals low force. So we can fill in the gaps on each of those by training for high force and high velocity separately which will hopefully move both of them up. You know, let's say I increase my force output by 5%. So now I can, you know, I went from lifting 100 pounds to lifting 105 pounds. Uh, and I increased my velocity from, we're gonna make up a number here, 10 miles an hour to 11 miles per hour. So I had a 5% increase in force and I had a 10% increase in velocity. Well, now I'm definitely way more powerful than I was before. Right? That's how we're going to create explosive athletes. We're going to make them lift heavy, but we are also going to make them lift light and explosive. Um, so uh, the ways that we are going to generate force, we got a couple different ways to do this. Uh, but one of the most important ways is where we consider what are called your force couples. Um, force couples uh, are where you have different muscles that are all working together. We commonly just refer to this as synergistic action, right? But it's basically the synergistic action of muscles around a joint. So think about like, um, when you think about like your, uh, your rotator cuff, force couple. When you think about your rotator cuff, it's the classic example of a force couple, right? Because when you look at it, right, let's say, look at this. I've got my scapula pulling down this way. I've got other scapular muscles that are pulling this way. And I've got deltoid muscles that are pulling this way. All of those things are working to control this joint as it moves through a different range of motion. They are all synergistically working together. So a force couple, uh, the only thing that's confusing about this term is it's like you hear the word couple, you think two. Um, but it's multiple muscles working together synergistically around a joint. When you think about like, um, uh, when you think about uh, your pelvis, right? Um, when you think about like your 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 whole pelvic girdle kind of working together as like a force couple, right? You have got like pelvic rotation that has to happen. You've got your abs and your glutes and your hamstrings and your hip flexors and your low back all of those muscles have to work together synergistically. If one muscle is doing too much work 
and it pulls you in the wrong direction, you're going to end up with maybe an anterior pelvic tilt or maybe a posterior pelvic tilt or a lateral tilt, right? If you train only one side of a joint consistently, that side of the joint is going to get overdeveloped and it's going to underdevelop the opposite side of that joint. Um, so uh, that is sort of some principles to movement that we're going to talk about. Uh, now, looking at the anatomy of your muscles here, obviously we have to have some terms for describing which muscle is doing what, because all of our muscles work in three different ways, right? They all work concentrically, eccentrically, and isometrically. So we have to have some key terms here for when a muscle is concentrically working versus when it is eccentrically working or you know when it's working isometrically so this is where we have our muscles as movers concept so you have got when a muscle is acting as an agonist uh that is when the muscle is responsible for a particular movement right that muscle is acting as a prime mover your glute for instance is the prime mover during hip extension so during a squat when you're coming out of that squat and you're accelerating against gravity, the agonist is your gluteus maximus. Then you've got the antagonist. You've got the exact opposite. When your muscle moves in the opposite direction, uh, you know, so for instance, when I'm coming out of a squat, the antagonist to my glute is directly on the other side of the joint. That is my psoas, right? My hip flexors. So the hip flexor complex is antagonistic of the hip extensors so they are an antagonist in this example but here's the thing if i were talking about like raising my leg up like this right if i were talking about doing this well that's hip flexion so now my hip flexor complex is the agonist and my glute is the antagonist so it does depend on what movement you are talking about every muscle in the body can be an agonist one mo moment and an antagonist the next and a synergist after that so every muscle in the body can be any of these things. Uh, it just depends on like what the movement is that you're talking about. You know, during a bicep curl, my bicep's the agonist. During a tricep extension, it's the antagonist. Um, then we got synergists, which are muscles that are there to help your prime mover. So your hamstrings, they do a little bit of hip extension as well, but they're there to help, right? So when your gluteus maximus is coming out of a squat, your hamstrings are assisting with that. Um, and so are your glutes, although the activation there is relatively weak. Um, stabilizers are muscles that are supporting and stabilizing your body uh, while you are, you know, sort of holding it through these full ranges of motion. So, for instance, your abdominals, right, your transverse abdominis are there to stabilize your abs, or I'm sorry, stabilize your spine while you are moving through like a squat or a push-up or a lunge or whatever, right? Stabilizer muscles are there um, to stabilize the body during these functional movement patterns. Um, oh, actually, oh, that's funny. There's some other terms here uh, that are in this PowerPoint, that are in this book. Um, I didn't put these in your notes because you're not going to be tested on these, um, but there are some groups. So we talked about how uh, you've got these force couples, right? So these force couples are muscles working together, and then you've got this agonist, antagonist, synergist, stabilizer relationship. Uh, there are some common ones in the body. So for instance, there is what's called your global muscular system. These are your movement systems. Um, the big ones that you've got is what's called your deep longitudinal subsystem. Um, and basically it looks like this. Uh, it is all of these muscles along here. Notice how it crosses from one side to the other. So it's your lats, your erector spinae, glutes, and hamstrings. And so it kind of wraps around your body in an X like this on both sides. That's the, the deep longitudinal subsystem. And if you have dysfunction in this, right? There we go, that's actually a really good one. If you see like a, a dysfunction in this, it's going to cause dysfunction during like transverse plane movements. So you can strengthen this by doing, and, and frontal plane movements. So you can strengthen this by doing like side planks and things like that. Um, you also have uh, 
your post uh, your posterior oblique subsystem. So this is creating stability along the posterior chain, right? Well, you've also got your posterior oblique subsystem. Again, this is going to kind of make an X uh, around the, the, the backside here. So this is also your lats, glutes, but then it comes around to your IT band. And then you've got your anterior oblique subsystem, which is like your obliques, your abdominals, and your adductor complex. So again, it's wrapping around the body. Um, actually, really quickly, Dalen, did you uh, did you guys go over this when you did massage? Did you do these subsystems? Oh, uh, I'm mute. I'm muted. Okay. Yes, we did. Did you? Yeah, uh, they're really common when you're talking about like fascial lines. Um, because you'll get somebody who has like an ache or a pain here and it causes problems like down here, you know, across the midline. Um, they don't, th this, you know, as long as you have like a full integrated training approach, worrying about these subsystems is a little bit beyond what you even need to do. Um, but yeah, that is, that's what these subsystems are. So there's the posterior system. There's the uh, uh, posterior oblique. There's the anterior oblique. They're called obliques because they're, they cross each other. Uh, and then there's your lateral subsystem. And your lateral subsystem, you probably already guessed this, are the muscles along the sides, okay? So this is gonna be like, you know, lateral movements, right? Um, so external obliques, for instance, um, IT band is gonna be adductor complex, right? All of the lateral stuff along the, the sides there. There we go. There's a picture of all of them all at once. I was like, I cannot believe I can't find a picture of like all four of these together. So you can see crossing over, uh, crossing over, and then lateral, and then deep longitudinal. So these are some subsystems that are very common uh, where you'll see like a lot of common injuries occur. Um, this is all just evidence and support for the fact that we need to have an integrated training approach so that we are working for integrated total body strength, right? Uh, working in all planes of motion. Um, so uh, last little thing when we're talking about training our clients and we talk about the nervous system. So we talked about the bones, we talked about the muscles. Let's talk about the brain here real quick. So when we're training our body, you know, uh, the thing that we are analyzing is our clients, we call motor behavior, right? Your motor behavior is your body's, your brain and body's response to stimuli, right? Internal and external. So when you pull a muscle and all of a sudden you, you know, if you've ever pulled a muscle and obviously like you just kind of collapsed or, you know, you took the weight off that muscle immediately, you didn't just like step through it. Um, that is like part of your motor behavior. Something went wrong internally, right? Uh, or, you know, when you grab something and you're like, wow, this is heavy. So then you recruit a lot of muscle. That's your motor behavior. You're responding to an external stimulus. So uh, there are three things that make this up. You've got your motor control, your motor learning, and your motor development. Your motor control is how your body is basically integrating information with previous experiences. So if you've ever tried to lift 100 pounds, let's say the first time you ever tried to lift 100 pounds, right? Um, your body was like, wow, this is really heavy. We've never lifted this much weight before. And then it learned how to leverage the resources in order to like overcome that much weight. Um, your body will remember that for the future. It remembers what it had to do in order to get that job done. That's your motor control. It's integrating, you know, uh, uh, information with previous experiences, but we can develop those experiences over time. That's where your motor learning comes in. Motor learning is like developing it. You know, the first time you do something, it's pretty awkward. You know, second time you do it, you get a little better. Third time you do it, you are developing motor learning, right? Um, anybody who's ever tried to pick up an instrument, learn how to play guitar, or learn how to play a video game or anything like that, and you're trying to learn like specific combinations of something, you know, that's your motor learning. Uh, and then motor development is how that changes over the course of your entire life. You know, um, your motor, you are developing your motor control consistently every single day. You know, you are, you are, you know, developing this very, very slowly over time. 
Um, so motor control uses your sensory information uh, with previous and, and sort of integrates it with the way your brain remembers how it did something last time. Um, and this includes, you know, things like proprioception, right? Your body's understanding of where it is in space. It includes like muscle synergies, you know, how to use like muscles to work together synergistically. Um, it puts all of that together. And then motor learning is something that we can help our clients develop. This is one of the reasons why effective coaching is so important. We need to give our clients, you know, they experience their own internal feedback because they're feeling what their body is going through. But we are acting as a source of what we call external feedback, um, which is, you know, us saying like, hey, that was a really good rep. That's an example of like knowledge of performance, right? Um, letting them know like, hey, you did a good job. And then knowledge of, um, sorry, that's knowledge of results. Knowledge of performance is, you know, feedback on the quality of the movement. You did a really good job of pushing your knees out during that squat. So now they're going, oh, okay. I remember what that felt like. That's their internal feedback. I did a good job and it was good because I pushed my knees out. That's example of like how we are going to help our clients enhance their motor learning faster and they're going to get better and better and better at it over the course of their entire life. Um, and that's what we're going to learn over the next, like I said, nine days. We got nine days left. We're going to look more at uh, how to coach our clients through getting better and better and better at these, you know, particular athletic movements. And that's about it today, guys. Um, that's the start of the sports book. You know, your homework today, not officially homework, uh, but please try to read through chapters one and two of this textbook. Right here, the one with the guy jumping up in the air on a track. Um, chapters one and two today. Uh, if you haven't gotten your cover letters or resumes, please continue working on those. Um, uh, the, if you haven't gotten your final in, it's, it's up, uh, the review video is up from yesterday as well. Uh, Canvas has been really weird and some of you guys got it in like right away. And then other people were saying like it disappeared halfway through the day. Um, and then other people, it was back. I, I yeah. And if you have trouble, please text me. Uh, let me know if your Canvas is, is not working. I don't know what was going on yesterday. Um, but like I had a couple students get it in. I know like one person said timed out, but it doesn't have a timer on it. So I don't know why that happened. Um, it was all over the place. So uh, please get your finals in if you haven't had a chance. Uh, it is Thursday. We're going to get our first piece of homework tomorrow for this class. Um, so I don't want anybody to get too far behind. Um, but yeah, that's about all I got for you. Any other, any questions today, guys? Base feeling good. Anybody else? Um, I just sure, heard about good. What, uh, sorry, what was that, Lauren? I can't, uh, can't quite hear you. Oh, I'm just concerned about uh, make sure I get my stuff um, done by tomorrow night because today yeah. is going to be out of. Well, you got the weekend. Me. You got the weekend. Okay. So, you know, if you're, I mean, obviously, like, if the, you know, if the room is spinning, you know, don't try to do your homework under that, you know. Okay. <laughs> Remember what we said uh, earlier? Quality over quantity. <laughs> that's it. That's right. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Dale, how are you feeling? Good. Yeah.